Dr. Kalam. Uh, and that was a vision of his that what uh, the Puras can achieve for the country. Now what I would like to take you across to is uh, how to translate that vision into a mission. Uh, I will also explain to you more about Pura in a theoretical sense and also on the existing Puras which we are working with and what they have achieved. And then he mentioned a word called Pura Activated and that is our future mission which is I will talk about towards the end of the slides. Uh, well, uh, okay, first I'll not do that. I'll do that later. Uh, in my introduction, we talked about uh, the degrees and all those things, but one thing I'd like to tell you more. I come, I belong to a small place called Pratapgarh. Has anyone heard about Pratapgarh? Okay, I'm, I'm famous. Okay, so within Pratapgarh, there's a small village called Barchama. That's where I belong to, that's where I grew up as a child, in Lucknow and at the little small village. I used to shuttle between them. And uh, it is a place which is still unfazed, untouched by the glowing and shining India story which we all see here. Much of our exposure with the outside world was through four people. One was the inspector sahib who used to come from Allahabad and would be a real goon of the area, would really push people. Then the other was the Dakia Babu, who would, Dakia Babu means postman. Dakia Babu would come uh, twice a month, with all the letters, very awaited guy by the way. Then there was a Neta Babu, the Neta Sahab would come once in five years perhaps, depending on the election scenario. And then there was this great uh, commander jeep. And this commander jeep would come, uh, this was an old device, but uh, extremely robust, heavy duty power. And this would come maybe once a fortnight, or twice a fortnight rather, and uh, you'll see about 20 people acrobatically climbing onto the jeep, going to Allahabad and all sorts of cities. And their acrobatics would even put, you know, uh, the uh, gymnasts from East Asian countries at, at some kind of uh, humility. So that was where I grew up. And uh, I've seen through the evolution of India and I've seen through the evolution of my place and places around it. And there is a lot of dissimilarity, let me tell you, between them. And the, the, the whole image of, uh, of an Indian village is portrayed in the classics, you know, the, the creative movies and all those things. And since many of you are here one generation more experienced than I am, then perhaps this character is Gabbar Singh and Ramgarh, you know, a typical village where uh, there's hardly any law and order, where there's the fragility in the socio systems where there's caste, all sorts of barriers are there and there's one this guy who rules it. And in my generation, things like Champaran, you know, the Lagans, Champaran, uh, an economic system so weak that the very thought of playing Do Guna Lagan, a double told, uh, makes villages shiver. So this is, this is how villages have been portrayed in our, uh, in our classic culture and that is how we have somehow uh, got an image of a typical Indian village. And that is uh, also reflected in how at least the government has been spending on it. I mean, this, this graph shows from the fifth plan onwards, every plan is a five-year plan for India, the kind of spending which has been going into it and that has been increasing uh, almost exponentially. And that little line over there is the, the share of the total outlay which is going towards rural development, irrigation or agriculture which is basically targeting towards the villages. More or less constant between the 18 to 22 percent range, the numbers have been increasing but the growth rate has been about as Dr. Kalam said, two, three, three and a half, four perhaps, that's all. And a lot of you are businessmen and that doesn't seem to be such a cool return, does it? So where has, where has the engine kind of misfunction and where the gaps lie. Perhaps the reason is because much of our approach so far has been either endowment based where you give money free to people, you subsidize, you do all sorts of funny things which you can but you don't empower or you believe in the philosophy of the great trickle down effect which never happens because uh, statistically showing uh, about a thousand rupees have to be generated for six rupees to trickle down to the below poverty line rural population, which is an efficiency of 0.6%, very low. And hence, uh, when we talk about 
Pura now. We will talk about a departure from the endowment and the trickle-down effect to an empowerment approach. And that is what Dr. Kalam also talked about. Why is, uh, so India is a very different country. You, you cannot compare it with any other country. With, we, have to, we have to accept the fact that the rural economy will be our baseline. We have to work with the 70% of the people. Villages occupy almost 95% of India's area, which includes all the major resources. Uh, and more importantly, it has more than 500 million people. 500 million people below 35 years of age. We need to work there. Oh, so this is the trickle down I was telling you, I've already told you, so I'll skip one. So what does Pura aspire to do? Pura aspires to bring the existing initiatives, the existing schemes, the existing whatever things are happening in rural areas uh, into one platform. And that is the kind of direction which Pura needs to give. If, if any of you are familiar with engineering, I'm an engineer. So that is basically magnet which aligns the ions together in one line to give magnetic effect. And that is exactly what Pura aspires to do. Now, what Pura aspires to be is a comprehensive development which has to go beyond just poverty alleviation. We have to grow out this philosophy that poverty alleviation, pull BPL people just above the line and that's it. We have to talk about comprehensive economic empowerment. We have to, uh, as the, uh, the, the introducer talked about, much of the urban poverty is actually a first generation rural poverty. We have to stem this distress migration through Pura. We have to use infrastructure which is a prerequisite rather than a consequence of development. All models uh, which Pura will talk about will be sustainable, financially, environmentally, socially, technologically. Then it talks about customization. That's where a huge failure has occurred when we talk about a street jacket mode of development for the Indian villages. Each village in itself is unique. It's, it's a unique culture, unique competencies, unique needs, and we have to address them. And then creating a knowledge society which, uh, with a value system uh, at the rural level. We, we cannot lose the value system of the society, but sometimes we ignore this fact. The, the ethical sustainability is also an issue. Okay, so Pura essentially talks about four kinds of connectivity. This is the theoretical part of Pura. Pura is four kinds of connectivity, physical, electronic, knowledge, and economic. So uh, I'll not get into too much of details, we have limited time, but uh, physical connectivity to start with basically talks about all the assets which we required to get the engine moving. You know, things like uh, connecting villages to cities or connecting villages within themselves and ensuring that some kind of transport happens, having buildings for schools, hospitals, and all those kind of school, uh, things which are uh, essentially a prerequisite for the development to start. So wherever Pura is happening uh, by the government or the private sectors, this is the first stage to work with. Then we talk about uh, the great IT revolution of India and how does that revolution reach the rural areas. And that's when the electronic connectivity comes into the play. Uh, things like preserving the native knowledge or uh, you know, connecting uh, the best medical uh, health care with the rural areas or connecting the training facilities from all sorts of across the world to the rural areas. And we also talked about things like MP, so it was yesterday. Even those kind of things uh, need electronic connectivity. And that is the electronic connectivity which Pura envisages at its second stage. This is another facilitator which is needed for development. Then that should lead to knowledge connectivity. So once you have an electronic connectivity across a cluster of villages, that should lead to a knowledge connectivity which would mean how knowledge can empower the co core competencies and how knowledge can address the core needs of the people over there. So again, this has to be customized according to the local, local area. So things like agro-processing technology, things like environment or forest management. Water management is a huge issue, huge, huge issue. Uh, when we'll talk about Chitrakoot Pura later, we'll talk about how just by the sheer magnitude of water management, you can transform a rural area. Uh, then we, uh, we'll talk about how uh, within knowledge connectivity, tele-education or tele-healthcare systems, how, how you can enable it. We'll also show you later how it has been done in places. And that all, all these three connectivities have to lead to something called the economic connectivity. And that's where the financial sustainability of the model has to come in. So small scale industries have to be nurtured and as Dr. Kalam talked about, agro-processing, fishing, dairy, all sorts of rural industry which you associate with uh, have to be nurtured 
using the three connectivities, physical, electronic, knowledge, should lead to the economic connectivity. And it's very significant because uh, even from a national perspective, uh, for example, India's dairy is the second largest, or, and in fact, the single largest industrial uh, contributor to the GDP. And that is the magnitude, you know, when you, and then when you work on sectors like dairy, uh, it, it actually also boosts the national economy, and hence, uh, the economic connect within Apura is extremely critical. Now, uh, this is, again, how things lead to, so all the, it's a little difficult to read, uh, so all the physical, electronic, and knowledge will lead to economic connectivity, and this will generate uh, entrepreneurs or large corporates who can go there and uh, extend them. Uh, service industry will come out, cooperatives will come out, uh, SHGs, SHGs, self-help groups, and women entrepreneurs will come out of it, and then small-scale industries will be generated. And the existing puras which we are working with, all of these things have been, you know, emanating out of this model. Okay, types of puras, basically we started with uh, four types of puras. So pura, uh, as Dr. Kalam said, pura complex. A pura complex is the atomistic existence of a pura. So a one pura complex will have anything between say about uh, 20 to 50 villages, a population of about 10,000 to 50,000, that, that's the kind of number. And uh, we basically categorize them uh, in actually six types. Uh, Plain terrain pura, which basically um, has, a class, has a population of about 20 to 1 lakh people. 1 lakh is 100,000. Uh, hill pura, which is more sparse and hence a lesser population is covered within it. Then a coastal pura will have about 20 to 30. Uh, desert pura, about 30 to 50 villages. The idea is that, uh, uh, I'll just get to the next slide and you'll know. So the, the reason why we categorize is because we want certain core competencies to be covered within that category and then a minimum scale of economy to be there. So uh, the maximum, that's uh, I was telling you, the maximum is about a lakh people and about 60 villages and the minimum is about 10,000 with about 10 villages. So this is the categorization for the Pura implementation which we do. Uh, well, uh, it can be participated by everyone basically. Uh, banks and government funds, and international agencies, industry, NGOs, NRIs, public sector, and the, the, across the nation now, uh, all these different kind of stakeholders are doing Pura in their own ways. Uh, I'll take you to the water will fall and there's this rainfall would be guided into the ravines and it's just flow out. So that was a critical problem over there. And because of the lack of uh, any economic activity, there was a lot of problem of, um, you know, people getting into crime and all those things. So two critical problems were there, water, and that, that should lead to socio-economic development and crime. So this Pura, particularly when it was, uh, it started as a rural mission and then later joined in the Pura vision, uh, particularly worked on improving agriculture, uh, entrepreneur development, value-based education, because this place had a problem with crime, and then quality healthcare. Uh, basically, it started by an NGO called uh, Deen Dayal Research Institute by uh, late Sri Nanaji Deshmukhji, who passed away last year at the age of 96. And uh, it focuses on sustainable and replicable solutions. Now, Chitrakoot Pura.